Hi, my name is Dan Keen. I'm a composer, producer, and musician based in London. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video, I want to show you how I take my music from door to score, from logic to Dorico. Now, the tips I'm going to be giving today are in relation to this video above, which I'll link at the end of this video as well, which was my demo for A Passion Art of Strings. In that video, I said that I would return at a later stage and show you how I would then notate this on a piece of software. So I use Logic Pro to do all of my writing and my arranging, and then I use Dorico to do all of my orchestration to take what was once a MIDI file and turn it into something that's readable for players, for musicians to play. I had a teacher once who told me that you should always score on paper or in a software before you create a MIDI mock-up. But I actually think it should be the other way around because more people can appreciate listening to something and hearing the direction you want to go with something rather than seeing something on a piece of paper and knowing what that means. So I always go down this route. Now, at some point, I would love for there to be a hybrid mixing pot between a DAW and a scoring software. That's the reason that I've chosen Dorico, because I believe at some point Steinberg will merge Cubase with Dorico, and I'm hoping that will be a really seamless experience. In the meantime, I'm still using Logic, but as you'll see, many of these tips will apply not only to Dorico, but any software you're using, Sibelius, Finale, or anything like that. So in this video, I want to take you through my tips for creating a template, preparing a Logic project for export, importing the file into your scoring software, cleaning up any errors, and then adding dynamics and phrasing. So I'm going to take you through the whole process from beginning to end. Now, this isn't going to be a super in-depth video because at some point I'd love to get an orchestrator like my friend Tristan Noon, who does all of my copying work. I'd love to bring him in and show us how he would then take what I've done and make it something really, really great. And I've been in sessions where players have asked to take it home and put it up on their wall because the orchestrations he creates are an absolute work of art. And I think something to bear in mind with all of these things is, you know, whether to invest in having an orchestrator or a copyist, ultimately they're going to save you money because they're going to leave fewer questions to be asked by the players for something to be legible, for something to be well communicated. That's really priceless in the very expensive game that is recording music. So before I step into tip number one, I just want to take you through a couple of things that I always make sure I do. This is going to save you a lot of time and it's also going to save you money on the other end. Number one is putting bar numbers on every single bar. You don't want players to have to fish around looking for the right bar or counting in from the sides. You always want to know exactly what bar you're at. And particularly for film scores, sometimes the bar lengths and the cue numbers can go up to in the thousands of bars. So this is always a big help. The second thing is bar ranges in rests. Sometimes we have what's called multi-rests where they consolidate bars into a single block. It's really helpful underneath that block to show what the range of these bars are. Again, it just saves time in the long run. Let's say you've got a really, really long rest, say 32 bars or something, and the conductor asks to start recording in the middle of that time. It's a lot easier for them to count in if they know exactly whereabouts within that chunk that bar falls. The third tip is using wildcard tokens in your scores. This is going to save you a lot of time if you're doing batches of things. So instead of writing the name of the title at the top, we can actually use an abbreviation which ties into the project information then we can set up that info to be whatever we want, and then on the manuscript, it's going to reflect those changes. For things like player names, part names, composers, orchestrators, for that information to be set behind the scenes is a lot easier than inputting it manually. Just a bit of housekeeping really is to have track titles at the top of every page. This is going to make it a lot easier for people to recognize what song they're between or what track they're going between. If you've got many cues in a film, sometimes pages get around the wrong way. So that's always really, really helpful. As a point of communicating your scores as clearly as possible, having large time signatures, large tempos, this is going to make it really easy, particularly for your conductor who might have lots of staves over a big score, to be able to see when a time signature change happens is really, really important. And then with splitting things up clearly, having text and double bar lines to separate sections is really useful, particularly in song structures. If the singer is in another room somewhere and they say, let's go from the second chorus, well, the orchestra might not know where the second chorus is. So marking that in is really, really helpful. Now, this last one I think is a little bit controversial and it's not something that I like to do very much, but it is scoring with accidentals. So you don't have any key signatures at the side. Every sharp or flat is marked with a sharp or flat sign. Apparently this is easier to read for players because they don't have to quickly check where the key signature is, but I actually find it to be a little bit annoying because if I know that a piece is in B major, 
it's not going to change. I would much rather have that on the side and then my music stays fairly clear. So I think it's kind of up to you, but I think the norm, especially within film sessions, is to do things atonally with accidentals. Okay, so the first place I'm going to start is actually in Logic. And before I do anything, I'm going to go over to Preferences and Audio, and I'm going to disable my core audio. This is going to mean when I open up my project, I'm not going to get bombarded with all the samples loading. I don't actually need to listen to it. I know how the piece sounds. I'm going to be preparing a MIDI file for export. Okay, so here's my file. So as you can see, none of the plugins have loaded, that's fine. So you can see that I've got many violin ones, many violin twos, violas, cello and basses. And the reason for this is because I just wanted to split things out. There aren't different microphones, there aren't really different mixes. Um, sometimes I've used additional parts, so I've separated the sections to include a couple of extra lines where I wanted the harmony to be a little bit fruity. But the main thing that I need to correct here is that every single note is a little bit out of time. And the reason for this is because legato transitions tend to be a little bit behind the beat. Naturally, it has to play the legato transition before it goes to the note. So I overcorrect for this by playing a little bit ahead. Now, if I were to export this as a MIDI file, it would just bring it into Dorico or Sibelius or any of these softwares and go, well, this is what you told me to do. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be very, very helpful. So the first thing that I would do is save this as, as like a little orchestration. So I could call this Appassionata Orc. And then I'm going to go in and very laboriously, I'm just going to quantize everything to the correct notes. So in this case, most of these are quarter notes. And if there are any little questions, I might come back to that to make sure that I've done it correctly. Now, basically, you have to do that the whole way through. And once you've done that, you then need to highlight your notes and remove any overlaps. Now, there's a helpful keyboard shortcut with this, which is shift backslash, and it just removes any of those overlaps, which is very, very helpful. Otherwise, you can, I think, right click. And then here it is, trim note end to following notes. So this is going to clean up our scores a lot. And if we just have a look in this score editor, you can see already, even within Logic, it looks fairly nice. As soon as we get to this bit, you can see that actually it's a little bit uh, higgledy-piggledy. Now, I would really recommend making sure that all of your tracks have titles that are fairly easy to follow. And if, for example, this was actually a violin two line, a way that we can make all of our regions the same as the track names is doing Shift-Alt-N. And you can see then that changes the regions. In this case, what we're actually going to be doing is highlighting all of our files, and we're going to create a MIDI file, which for this is Command-Alt-E. And I'm just going to save it as a Passionata org. This process of going in and creating a MIDI file can be quite time consuming, but it's really worth making sure that everything's really neat and tidy before you export, because otherwise you're going to have a lot to clean up on the other side. Once we've finished there, we can right click on our MIDI file and click Open with Dorico. Now in this case, I'm using Dorico 4, which has some new MIDI import options, and they're really, really handy. Um, basically, it can learn based on the types of orchestrations that you do, the type of imports that you do. So you can see here that there's this track memory at the top here. If I disable this, you'll see that originally, it thought this bass's leg was actually a bass guitar. Sounds quite obvious. Um, but because I've imported files before that have bass's leg, it has correctly identified that this is actually a double bass. So if I were to disable my selected here, you can see that if I just import all of these things all in one, it's basically creating one, two, three, four, five, six violins. That might not be particularly helpful. And in fact, what I would recommend doing is starting with your separate instruments on their own. So I would start with just selecting the violin ones. As you can see, there aren't any simultaneous notes, so that's good. And I can just click OK, and that's going to open up our file here. So you can see that for the most part, it already looks pretty good. You can see there's a run here, which is a little bit ugly. Um, but other than that, it has correctly identified everything for the most part. Now you can see that throughout all of this, there's actually only one line for a lot of it. And so instead of creating a violin two, what we really want is to create a separated part for violin one. So what we would do in this case is highlight the section that we want. And then we can go into Edit, Notations, staff, and then click change divisi. And in this case, we want to add another section player. So this divides it into one and two. All I would do then is take those notes, copy them, and then paste them in here. And then once that's finished, I can actually bring this up here. 
And then when it goes back to one part, I can go to Edit, Notations, Staff, and then click Restore Unison. So you can see here that it's duplicated the part, which is correct for the way that it would be written here. Um, and then at this point, I'm going to separate it again. So I can go to Notations again, Staff, Change to Visi, and then I actually need three for this one. So then I can copy this into here and copy this into here. So now I can remove my violin 2 and violin 3 from the setup over here. I can just click delete. And now we've got a fairly legible part that is just a single violin that separates into the relevant Divisi sections. That's exactly what we want. Now I would repeat this process then of doing this with every single instrument which in this case isn't very many because we've only got about 12 different instruments. But obviously on a big orchestral piece, this could take quite a lot longer. So in this initial stage, you'll have seen that there were some signposts here indicating what the tempos were. I have actually gone in now and added those tempos so that it is in keeping with what the Logic Project has. So I've just clicked on a part here and then done Shift T and I can do quarter note equals, say, 150 BPM, and that then gets added as a tempo marker, not just as text, but a physical tempo. So now I've added all of my individual parts, and as you can see, it looks fairly decent. We've got some issues here that we need to resolve with this run, uh, but for the most part, everything's legible. We've got all of our parts here. I've added a solo cello line because uh, there was a second line there. And you can see that it's separated things into four bars per system. This is quite large for A4, so I'm actually going to change this. If I go into my layout options, I'm going to change this to A3, and I might change the size down to 4.8. That looks quite nice. Now, something I mentioned before was wildcards, and we may as well do this now while we're here. If I go into my engraving options, I can open up my default view. And as you can see at the very top here, it says flow title. So instead of movements, Dorico calls it flows, which is basically a single document. So I can go in here to my project info, and I can call this title whatever I want, really. But the name of the piece was called Reunited at Last. And you can see that this is the title of the flow. So in the same way, I'm going to call this Reunited at Last. And I can say that this was composed by me, Dan Keen. And I could add any other information that I might want to as well. Once I hit Apply and then Close, you can see that the title has been added, the composer has been added, and this has been added as well. Now, the default page layout refers to how this second page would look. The first page is indicated by this. So if I wanted to change the font, I could go in here, and my house style is actually Baybus Kai. Um, so that's just what I quite like. So I can click Apply, and then you can see that that has changed there. It is also possible to change this. If we go up to Library, we can click Paragraph Styles, and we can change our default text. So for example, I can change this over to Baybus Kai. I can also do the same on my bar numbers and score. But I might not want it to be italic. And I can click OK. And now that changes everything. This makes it look a little bit neater, I think. Now, a few things to look into in our layout options. We've talked about the size, and we've talked about the size of this. I'm actually going to change this down to 5.5. Feels a little bit small at the moment. One thing we can do is bar numbers. So I've changed this every single bar. While I'm in this bar numbers, I can click on this show ranges of bar numbers under multi rests. So that's what we were talking about here before, where it shows the range of the bars. Next, I go to my multi-bar rests, and I add this multi-bar rest here. And this is looking pretty neat now. Now, one thing I should say is, in this first section, the reason that there are so many bars rest here is because I basically had a whole load of sketches before I started writing my piece. I don't need to have this here, but I would like people to know that it's bar 20, because if I'm recording into the project, say I'm recording into Pro Tools or Logic or something like that, all of my tempo changes happen after this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I have a tempo marking and a meter change so that's just what time signature we're in at this point here. And then I need to go into my layout options again and disable multi-rests for just a second. I need to delete all of these bars here. Now you'll see that here it now says bar 1 and bar 2, and that's not what I wanted. So if I click on this and then go to bar numbers, 
add bar number change. And in this case, I'm going to select bar 21. So now even though this says 1, really people will know that this is bar 20, if this is bar 21, 22, 23, etc. So that's fairly easily communicated to everyone involved. So this is coming along quite well now. Now I'm going to have a look at this run. So what I want is a run with all the same durations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a note here and make sure that this is a semi-quaver. And I'm then going to highlight all of these and I can click this semicolon and create a ratio. So in this case, I need to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight within the space of 10 semiquavers. So if I do a ratio of eight to 10, that's created that nicely. And now if I just that looks nice and neat. So where necessary, you might find that you have to rewrite certain sections. And what I really like about Dorico is that it makes it very easy. If I wanted to shift this all over by a quaver, I can do that very easily and it doesn't mess anything up. So I can literally just press Alt and then the arrow key and I can just move things and very intelligently it knows what is best suited to that particular position within the bar. Now at this point we might also decide that we want to put in some keys. You can see at the beginning here we're in C major. Well I know that this is actually in E major so I'm going to create a new key signature which is just Shift K and I'm going to add E for E major. And you can see there that it's already removed a lot of the accidentals which I think looks a lot nicer. Now at some point we go into F sharp major here so again, I'm going to do the same thing, F sharp. And with this bit here, we're kind of entering into a strange kind of atonal section. Uh, so what I might do is actually from this point, I might create another one and just put this in C. And then we move back into E major by the end here. So again, I might add another one for E. Now, I guess this is up to your own discretion whether or not you want to make it so that things are changing every few bars. You might just want it to be atonal the whole way throughout. I think it's completely up to you, to be honest. Now, you can see that it's already created a double bar line, which is quite helpful. What I'm going to do to make this even easier to read is I'm going to add a little system break. So it's just Shift S in Dorico. So it would be the same here. And then this one's already been added, but I'll just make sure it gets added. Now, adding system breaks is a nice way to break up your scores anyway, but you might also find that you want to add rehearsal marks. That can sometimes be helpful just with a letter A or a number one or something. Um, and if I were doing this as a song, I might also add some system text at the bottom here. So I would click on this and then hit right and then go down to system text and I can just click on default text. So then I would add, say, chorus 2. I might make that a little bit bigger. And what's nice about using system text is that when I then go over to my violin ones or something, people can see where the chorus 2 is. So now that we've got our keys in place, we've got our system breaks, things are starting to look quite nice, but we still need to add some slurring and dynamics. Now I would make this fairly simple. Um, for the most part, players are fairly intuitive. They know if something needs to be a little bit louder or a little bit stronger. And sometimes I like to give the players the benefit of the doubt, not to cram it with too much information. But Dorico 4 instinctively knows that there is a slur if you have any overlapping legato. So I must have missed this one here. But basically, all I'm going to do is go in and kind of decide how I might want it to be played. So when necessary, I'd highlight my notes and hit S there. And I quite like this process. Um, I find it fairly easy as a string player anyway. I have a fairly instinctive way that I would play something. Um, but if you don't know how you'd want it to be done, um, that's maybe where an orchestrator would be helpful or just speaking to the leader of the section before you start and say, how would you play this? And they can then communicate this back to their section. Often it's quite nice to mimic things. So um, for example, we have this do, do, do. So we might want to do, do, do with a nice little slur there. You can see because this is in unison, um, it replicates across the board. So that's a lot easier as well. And once we've finished that, we can add our dynamics. Now you can see I've gone ahead and done this now. Um, so, you know, starting quite quietly, things build up, things go back down again. You can see for the most part that I'm only really using um, kind of the, the name of the dynamic or some hairpins. So in this case, what I can do in Dorico is I can highlight say this bar, if I want this to be a crescendo, and I can just do shift and then the more than symbol. And that could be a nice little diminuendo there. Now, something I wanted to draw attention to is you might notice that all of our dynamics are slightly all over the place. A way to make this a lot neater is to highlight everything 
and then filter and go to dynamics, just all dynamics. And then I'm gonna right click this, go to dynamics, click ungroup just to be sure. And then I'm gonna go and group. And you can see that it pulls everything down. This makes it a lot more legible. And I don't know why this isn't a thing by default. Another thing I want to draw your attention to is you'll notice here that for some reason, these dynamics have gone across the bar line. This is just a thing that you can select if you want to. Um, it's on by default, which I do not like, but you can go to filter. And if you click on all dynamics again, and then I'm gonna go down into this inspector and I basically need to go over here to bar line interaction. If I turn this on and click stop before, you'll see that that has sorted that issue out now. Now on the whole, I'm really, really pleased with how Dorico shows everything. In fact, if I go into my instruments here, I haven't done anything to these, but you can see that they all look really, really good. Um, so this is quite reassuring. And obviously, if I had an orchestrator on this project, I would take this file and then go even more in depth. But I hope that shows you just a little bit about how to go through the process of starting from the beginning and working your way all the way through a project. If you'd be interested to see how I would get an orchestrator to come in and get them to show us how they would do it, take it to that next level, let me know down in the comments down below. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't done already, and I'll see you again very, very soon. Goodbye.